Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well and taking good care of yourselves. Today, we want to double down on what we started discussing last time, which was uh, how do you learn the art of asking effective questions? Let me start by explaining why do questions matter and uh, what are some of the common mistakes people make when framing questions? So questions matter fundamentally because we live in a world where uh, information is being thrown at us from all corners. Every day, there are hundreds and thousands of new articles, essays, blogs, books, media information, onslaughts come our way. Uh, if we let answers direct our attention, we will essentially drown in an over, you know, overextension of our uh, mental capacities. And uh, if we are able to be become more intentional about the questions that we pose, we can direct our attention in the right way, learn what to ignore and what to pay attention on, okay? So when you're writing, say, an article, when you're uh, deciding to maybe publish a book, publish in a scientific journal, write your uh, master's thesis, decide what strategy should your company take, uh, you know, make correct inferences about where you want to go. You want to first figure out uh, and spend 80% of your time on guiding the question. Once you have a pointed question, you can get to the answer. But if you are essentially searching for all across the world, all around the internet to become smarter, it'll become challenging. So one of the big problems that I have with the current crop of influencers and LinkedIn wisdom that comes our way is that it's essentially uh, driving on a, uh, on a road where there are no traffic rules. So whether you get from point A to point B is purely a matter of luck. Because if you're lucky and not too many cars are coming in your direction, you'll get to your destination. However, the likelihood of that happening becomes very low. So I actually urge you to reduce your information flow. Don't feel the need to follow every influencer who's very popular on social media platform. You don't need to catch up with everything that is happening in the world around you. If you're not particularly interested in, in the world of sports, you don't necessarily need to become an expert in the latest details about the Wimbledon. Although I think if you are, you'll find it fascinating. So it comes down to reorienting and repivoting where you want to go. So Varya wrote a very popular article yesterday on Barbie and existentialism in the Vogue, which is a substantive achievement. Why don't you explain, Varya, how did you go about framing the question and uh, existentialism is not a small topic. It's many people have said many things about it. Uh, one of my most cherished birthday gifts have been a, you know, an essay about existentialism. But I can tell you that the existential question has 100 sub questions. So Varya, maybe you can explain how you decided to uh, focus on one question for the article. Um, I think existentialism as a topic has been something that I've been thinking about for a while. So honestly, the prompt for this particular article was not existentialism, it was Barbie. Um, when I saw the Barbie trailer and more specifically the blurb which came with it, it said that Barbie has an existential crisis which was very fascinating to me because the idea of Barbie and what she was and what she stood for um, to me and a lot of other people growing up was very different. She was supposed to be this perfect thing that had all the right answers, knew everything. So to see Barbie go through an existential crisis and experience it was very fascinating. And I think that sort of became the point of inquiry and then I basically watched the trailer many times to see what are some clues and things I can pick on and how can I connect it to exist existentialism without making it too academic because if it does become too academic I lose half the audience. Yeah so look uh, uh, when it comes to Barbie the character and un, 
or not so obvious spin is existentialism, which makes it appealing to uh, various readers. Um, on the more obvious aspects of Barbie, the debates have been around gender and sexuality. So uh, should, uh, you know, quote unquote, the ideal uh, girl or woman look like that, speak like that, have answers ready on that. So that is one level of inquiry. The other is existentialism. The third is branding. So a lot has been written about uh, how Barbie, you know, this mythical character has implications on how marketing is done, how artificial intelligence use cases are employed, LLM, so on and so forth. Uh, there are questions about pricing as well. Um, should, you know, a character like that exist, which is, uh, I'm not sure how much a Barbie costs, but I would be surprised if it is too inexpensive. So there are implications around that uh, alongside. Then a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people who are part of the, what's called the Men Rights Academy or act, it's, it's called MRA, I'm not sure what the A in that stands for, but uh, they are the ones who are saying that, hey, you're almost uh, uh, degrading the guy in the movie by calling him like a rando, while Barbie seems to have uh, so many characters. So you you will not be able to have all answers about Barbie when you begin your research or when you decide to have an opinion. However, asking good quality questions means looking for three levels. One, has this been attempted before? If yes, what's, what's the new angle that you can explore? Second, is that being who you are with your set of experiences, with your set of uh, you know unique uh, adventures that you've had, do you add anything substantial to the table? Do you bring anything substantial to the table? Um, and here your lived experience matters. If you're a person who identifies or who've gone through a relevant experience that would shape it, uh, a good question will enable you the opportunity to ask it. So when I was uh, interviewing Indra Nui for, for, the, uh, for the discussion, um, we, of course, explored commonalities, which were INSEAD and, uh, you know, working with large companies, consulting, those kinds of things. But uh, from my lived experience, career transition was a theme that I wanted to double down on. So you got to pick how your experience can make a question better and more relevant for the sources that you're seeking for. And the third lever when it comes to uh, enabling good question is editing. So what is the kind of information that you remove in order to make the question precise? I have office hours uh, you know, every day where lots of people ask me lots of questions about life, work, career, how to go to, what to ignore, what not to ignore. But uh, many times I notice that even the best of people are not really prepared for the conversation. And they're not prepared for the conversation because they've not had these three levels of uh, uh, analysis done before uh, framing that particular question. So my recommendation would be when it comes to uh, just figuring out your knowledge map, you spend 80% of your time thinking about the questions that you want to explore. Once you've done that, look at applying these three levers to make your question better. And once you've done that, try and focus big time on simplifying the question. A more complicated question doesn't need to sound complicated. It can be simply asked in a, in a way that, uh, that can give you the clarity that you want and the person or the sources that are uh, that are giving the answer they will enjoy so when i host people on podcasts many of them actually most of them are pretty well known and i would say intellectually they are uh, you know definitely at a certain standard so what i ask myself is that what can i present to them or what can i pose to them that they would have perhaps not thought about recently, other people may not have uh, posed the same question to them. And based on my reading and research, can I bring to bear a new angle? All right. And now this might seem very complicated to all of you, because on a day you would have been asked like tens of questions and you would be asking many questions, but typically you get better at it. In the beginning, when I would prepare for podcasts, it would take me days. Now it takes me hours. 
you know, on things that I know really well, it takes me even less than that. So the key is that these three levers of questioning become part of your operating system. And I'd like you all to get to that level where the questions that you bring to bear are much beyond the obvious, yeah? So what's, uh, what are some of the good questions that people have heard or come across so far? One question that Peter Thiel poses that, uh, that has become really popular in technology and Silicon Valley circles is uh, what's something that you believe in that others often disagree with? Another you know, good question that uh, people are asked, uh, what is something that you've changed your mind about when it comes to X, Y, Z? And uh, how did you change your mind? Yeah. And you'll notice that a, a, a good question will open up many questions. So if some, somebody answers, what's something that you believe in that others often disagree with is suppose you're in, in, uh, your answer is that I believe that uh, in today's world, free will is, uh, uh, is overrated or free will is underrated and we have never been free. We will never be free. This is just uh, uh, you know, a sort of a smoke screen ahead of us. So then if you, this in, in itself, this answer is opening up room for a discussion. However, if you answer things like, uh, what's something you believe in? Oh, I believe in God. Lots of people believe in God. And if you say, I don't believe in God, lots of people don't believe in God. So this in itself is, what you call a, a, a not such a good way to initiate a conversation or initiate a discussion that will enable you to go deeper. Look, the ultimate purpose of a question is to have a substantive conversation. And I'd add another layer to it, an efficient, creative and substantive conversation. And efficiency matters a lot. Because you can ask the same thing that you're asking in 3x the amount of time. Because you haven't thought this through, so you're, you're figuring it out while you're speaking, and then you land. An efficient way to, to do that would be to just keep pointers in mind that what, what am I really getting at? What specific information do you really want? Suppose you're going to graduate school, or suppose you're uh, deciding to change jobs, or suppose you're deciding to upskill yourself and you're speaking to somebody who has limited time, or even if they have lots of time, you don't want to bore them before you get to the main point. So your question needs to include what some people call the second order thinking. Second order thinking comes down to saying that what is the real question that I'm asking and what is the second level of knowledge that I'm hoping to uh, get to from this particular question. So what is uh politics is is an okay question uh when you're asking say a politician what aspects of politics surprised you when you came into uh this field 20 years back so this question is posed in a very particular time frame this question is also very particular to the politician this question is likely to make the person you're asking uh think through and give a reflective answer, which means that the person answering it will probably also enjoy uh, the pursuit of answering it. And you will, as let's say you're a 20 something person, you will also see that, okay, uh, this particular person who's now almighty and powerful, when he or she was my age, they were perhaps dealing with very similar existential doubts or very similar things. So you get limited time in the world to ask the right set of questions. If you do ask the right set of questions, you have a chance of getting to answers that might change your life. So don't deny yourself these answers and really get to uh, master the art of asking the right questions. So let me give you a, a couple of examples of how to do that. Some of you might know that the world is going through some version of a recession, yes or no? Yeah, suppose you're sitting down with a, a, you know, a senior policymaker who has some decision-making capability or a person you know, who understands macroeconomics well. Um, you have two approaches. 
and you can either ask or approach the field like a child okay or you can you know really go through the levers that i have walked you through the three levered approach focused on a particular uh, subject going through the filters editing all of it focused on second order thinking i'm here to make the case that both methods are really effective the asking like a child method is also really effective and the more sophisticated layered version that i walked you through is also pretty really uh, effective can somebody tell me why the child method works or why might the child method work if i'm very new to a particular field and if i don't have a idea about the particular subject and uh, still i have to you know talk to the subject expert so if i am no idea about the particular subject then uh, i mean uh, it's okay for me to uh, be a child for the particular matter yeah uh, again I, i that's that's definitely um there are parts of what you said which makes sense uh, yes anisha uh, a child method might work uh, because it brings uh, maximum curiosity to the table um, and and it shows the passion um, in that way so also i can give reasons that it might not work because it's not really second order thinking absolutely there are elements of truth in what uh, anisha also walked us through look the child method works because it is dis it sounds disarmingly simple but answering that can be very complicated an example of that is steven pinker's new book or oh no uh, somewhat old book uh, enlightenment now so if you read the early pages of the book what uh, he says started off this adventure was that one of his students in harvard essentially asked him in some of his lectures in philosophy why should i live okay now why should i live is not like you know on the surface it sounds like a very simple question yeah like you should live to enjoy the world you should live for your parents you should live for your loved ones etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you truly want to answer this question why should you live uh it becomes fairly substantive sometimes it becomes a full book so the entire thesis of steven pinker's book enlightenment now is the answer to the question that naively somebody asked him in class why should i live and the answer that he gives through 350 pages through charts and graphs and anecdotes here is that the arc of progress of the world is in the positive direction poverty is reducing uh, literally on every single metric the world seems to be better than it was hence you should live hence enlightenment is one of the reasons that will lead the world towards a positive outcome even though a lot of it seems negative life is still worth living the challenge about with the child like approach is that it is not sensitive to time so to answer this question steven pinker basically wrote a book you can't write a book in 20 minutes or 10 minutes so the child method is very very useful when you know that time is not a limiting factor the child method will bite you if you go to a conversation or uh, a discussion where you have 15 minutes or 20 minutes and you start with those questions it's typically a very risky approach because the judgment that the person answering could come to is that this person either doesn't know anything or is completely unprepared to have this call or hasn't done the pre work required to be able to have a substantive conversation and since many of you work or study in what i call high pressure intense environments uh you will struggle if you make the child method your default method okay so what i do is that i ask or i try and employ the child method uh where my competence cannot be questioned okay let me explain that so that it becomes clear when i study philosophy in oxford okay i i have made it very clear that i am a beginner in this field i don't know too much i have curiosity so because i i've already said that i don't know anything 
So I've established that I have a license to be a child because I'm competent enough to sit in the classroom. But because I don't know enough, so don't expect me to have prior knowledge. So it's a license that has been established and hence, because for my own sake, I need to do that. However, if I employ the same mindset in a business school classroom or in something to do with ed tech, people will think that, okay, this person should probably need to do more unless and until you've reached a stature or a state where you have the license to pose uh, the big questions that face humanity. Like Bill Gates, for example, asking about what should be our philosophical approach towards climate change. That question is a lot more uh, room for discussion than say you or I. So the point here is one child method is inefficient, but very useful. Employ it selectively. Uh, for most people who are working in high intense environments, education or profession, what you need to do is to earn your credibility. In certain areas, you can employ the child method, but in many areas, you will have to demonstrate and deploy uh, this, this layered approach. So I want you to do an exercise right now. You all, I think, know me reasonably well. Take five minutes to ask me anything you want, okay? You, once again, you know me fairly well. Uh, my life is reasonably public. Now you have this unique opportunity to ask me anything. And what would you ask? How would you choose it? It's 3.25 p.m. where I'm sitting right now. And at 3.30 p.m., I will ask you to ask me anything and I will answer it. And then I will grade you on the quality of your questions. Got it? So take five minutes and turn your cameras back on in that time.
Um, Utkarsh, I think we are good to start with the questions. We are? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Yeah. Uh, so my question is on your uh, conviction towards Web3 blockchain uh, career. So uh, I believe, you know, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, prior uh, education and experience into, uh, into you, you had your MBA and you are having this, this, this firm. So, so why did you, you know, uh, choose to move, uh, like, you know, uh, to, uh, to join, uh, fire and uh how did you earn those required skill set because that's very you know tech heavy uh it might require technical knowledge and how did you convince those that uh that that you are the right person uh you know uh to to lead them because uh cmo is a quite i mean it's a very tough role and big role okay so, great so this is, uh, I think on a scale of question, this is an inefficient question, but I'll answer it and then I'll tell you a way to make this inefficient question into a more efficient question, all right? So the answer is that fire.org acquired a stake in network capital. This is public information and you should know that, right? Second is that as part of the stake acquisition, they said that, okay, we'll buy this much stake, uh, you get blah, blah. And as part of that, you also become the CMO. This is also public information, so you should know that. Not right now, I'm just telling you that how you should typically, public information, you need to know. And you know, I like obviously this is not required for uh, every human being on the planet, but let's assume somebody you're having a conversation with uh, uh, is short on time, that's the way to go. And in terms of, I think your real question is, that, is there a way for uh, young professionals to transition from uh, yeah, right. Web 2.0 knowledge to Web 3.0 knowledge. And if you can reference your journey from uh, Microsoft to Network Capital to Fire, that would be very helpful. I think yeah, this I think is the know. way you should phrase the question. This is the ideal question you really want to ask. But the way you wanted to ask was quite, in, quite inefficient. So you will take this feedback. And the way you answer, the way I'll answer is that, so this is the context, Fire acquired a stake in it. It was a very standard deal transition. And uh, I have not transitioned from anything. I am the CEO of Network Capital and the CMO of the blockchain company per se. So um, the role was that, do you have the insights required to do that for Web3 and how did you get those insights? So uh, for running Network Capital, passion economy is a central tenet. And Passion Economy, my book, is focused on how the internet is evolving, and Web 3.0 is a big component of that. I've written extensively about it. And the, uh, the principal element that Web 3.0 uh, brings to bear is the importance of communities. How do you build and scale a community, which is pretty much what network capital has been all about. So then the question becomes, are there technical aspects to upskilling from uh, internet 2.0 to internet 3.0? And there the answer is 100% yes, because you need to have a, a, a fairly nuanced understanding of what differentiates one blockchain from the other. But those are solvable problems if you have the right toolkit. And the right toolkit in Web 3.0 is principally the understanding of community, which, which we've all, all, all done. And to sum up, if you look at any career transition, um, learning new things is actually not a particularly hard thing to do if you have your fundamental building blocks of knowledge in place. If you don't have those knowledge, those bits of knowledge, then you will struggle. But for other people and other opportunities, it won't be that hard. So overall, I think your question was okay. I want you to think about making questions very precise and very specific and knowing public information. Thanks. Um, I think Yashasvi has put a question in the chat. Yashasvi, do you want to just quickly um, ask it out loud? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for this. Uh, so the question I came up with is, Utkarsh, you've had a lot of conversations with very successful and reputed people on network capital. 
and uh, a lot of those have been around navigating careers. So uh, what would be, you know, the top three most useful advices according to you from all these conversations? Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is an above average question um, uh, because she's, uh, she's basically looking for a synthesis of what are the common elements that uh, successful people on network capital have shared in common. And I'll tell you why it's an above average question, not a great question after I answer this. So I noticed that the most successful people are typically the ones who are able to stick with, you know, a problem, stick with some amount of discomfort for a long amount of time. Shashi Tharoor, for example, in 2014, I believe he was accused of murder of some kind because of the media things, right? You can imagine how, like, that is perhaps the deepest accusation anybody can have. Uh, uh, can place on anybody else. And he basically had to live with that for a decade. And in that decade, he still won the elections. He still published books. He still went out there and he's still able to do that. And once you get into the process of getting some fame, you should expect some amount of backlash and your ability to withstand that is, uh, is one element that I see. The second is that the sub successful people that I host typically, they know where to play and they also have a sense of what is their competitive advantage. So um, they know that if their strength is uh, analytical thinking or if their strength is uh, being able to build a consensus across people, they make that 80% of their job. So they play on their strengths. I am yet to come across a person who built his or her career on something they were okay at or were sort of struggling with and then ended up doing very well. Because it is, a, it is generally very difficult to do something for long periods of time very well on something that you don't have a competitive edge on. Because uh, even if you uh, look at sporting careers. Yesterday's Wimbledon final is an example. Uh, Djokovic is a world-class among the best players of all time, but he was just not able to compete with the younger, faster uh, player who was better prepared. So the inference from that was not that Djokovic is any less than that, or the, the new player, uh, Alcaraz, is uh, much better than anybody else. It's just that there comes a time when you need to know which strengths to optimize for and what to uh, what to uh, what to ignore. There's a really interesting article by Arthur Brooks, which was uh, which is something along the lines of uh, slowing down your career or your um, your career is going to meet an inevitable decline. Where he makes the case that at different phases in their lives, you need to know what game to play. And the last thing that I notice is among really successful people, they tend to be very well read across disciplines, which means that they also know what not to do, what uh, information to ignore, and what information to take. So Warren Buffet, for example, he uh, he's he's well read not just about finance, but he knows a lot about a lot of things. So I'll notice that uh, these three would be the commonalities. Now, why, why this is an above average question is that uh, an average question would be what makes people successful? An above average question would be on network capital based on the people that you hosted, what are the three recurring themes? Definitely a good question. And what will make this a great question would be, what's the most unobvious uh, commonality you have observed across the most successful people that you hosted? on the internet, also oh, on, on network app, right? So <clears throat> typically a lot of career advice is very obvious advice, play to your strengths, don't waste your time, do deep work, have good habits. There's nothing too surprising about any of them, yeah? But if Yashasvi uh, had posed that, it would make that above average question into a great question, I think, okay? Right, thank you. Mm, Anisha, do you want to go next? Sure, Varya, thank you. <clears throat> um, Utkash, this is uh, 
so the question here is that uh, you have been um, advocating and writing a lot about uh, being a deep generalist and at the advantages of it. You even uh, posted an article um, with examples. So um, you, in fact, yourself have given, given an example that uh, you chose MBA over another degree uh, because it showed advantages of being a deep generalist. Have you come across an example in your own life where you wished that being a specialist would push you more towards the category of one and and maybe perhaps this example could um, enlighten and give examples to other yeah this this question is between above average and very good so every question that i'm getting is rising up a notch and i'll again i'll answer the question then i'll explain what prevented it from being great question but it's definitely between above average and 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 great <laughs> um, just to add a last bit to this uh, Perhaps your example could be something that you have not written so far. Yeah. Okay, great. So look, uh, there are very clear advantages of being a specialist. Specialists tend to uh, earn a lot more money in the short term. Specialists have a very clear identity. If you're the best cardiologist in, in New Delhi, you are the best cardiologist in New Delhi and people will pay you a whole bunch of money and fame in order for you to do whatever services you want. If you're the best machine learning engineer in Apple, you are the best or among the best machine learning engineers at, at Apple. So specialism, of course, has its, has its advantages. So you should uh, uh, not discount specialism as opposed to deep generalism. So your question makes me think, what should young professionals choose? Should they choose becoming a specialist or should they become choose becoming a deep generalist? My answer is that they should choose deep generalism over specialism, fully acknowledging that being specialist, if you're really, really a specialist at something that the world wants to reward, you will probably do better. Okay? So this is where things become counterintuitive. Most of our lives, we've been taught to become the best at something, become the best boxer, become the best runner, become the best cardiologist, become the best painter. Look, the thing is, it's very, very difficult to become and retain being the number one for a very long time. Again, the Wimbledon example, for those of you who like tennis or don't like tennis, if you watch the match, you will see an absolute world champion, which is Djokovic, just not being able to retain the number one spot, perhaps because of his like, you know, body being 35, not 20, uh, or you know, like the other person having certain advantages that he doesn't have. So retaining the number one spot is very competitive. For most people, it will not work out. The second is that, do you need to be number one or can you be among the best? You can be among the best. So if you're among the best, you will get a lot of you know, benefits and rewards of that. But I still come to the conclusion, for most people, it's much more uh, efficient to be among the top 20% at three different things than trying to be the number one at any one thing, okay? So I would say that uh, you can start by trying to be the top 20% at three different things. You'll notice that many people will not be able to, you know, build their category of one at the intersection because this is a lot more focused on you as opposed to anybody else. And if you notice that there is a subject or there is a field that you've become deeply interested in, you can try to become the top 1% in that 20% and keep doing that on, uh, on repeat if you choose to be. So for me, this approach is a lot more pragmatic than specializing early. My biggest challenge is that most people specialize without knowing why or without having a particular interest in it. And that tends to backfire. And, uh, it tends to become a life where uh, you are doing a whole bunch of things, but your outputs are just not uh, in line with your inputs. Now, what will make Anisha's question a, a great question would be this. What's the, uh, how would you critique your own advice on becoming deep generalists, knowing that specialists tend to just get the biggest rewards everywhere? Given this, would you change your advice? So this is also, I've basically paraphrased each of your questions and made them into one, an answer which is fairly binary. At, if this is the question, then I have to say, 
that yes, I changed my mind about deep generalists, or no, I'm going to stick with the deep, deep generalist advice, but I concede that specialists have a role to play and they probably win more in whatever they choose to do in certain fields for sure, STEM, medical science, et cetera. Okay. I've got one question to ask. So um, yeah. it's actually well known that you, you, you were part of the Ashoka Fellowship. You also did philosophy at Oxford. So I have a question uh, around philosophy. Like when you studied philosophy, how has it helped you? And why should one actually consider reading philosophy? These are my yeah. questions. So this is also what you call, uh, this is this question is also, I would say average, and you can do a lot more to, uh, to make it. One is that this question I've answered publicly. It's a newspaper article, why people should read uh, philosophy from a startup lens. Uh, second is that the way you want to phrase this would be that you don't seem to be a person who has a lot of time. Why would you torture yourself by studying philosophy uh, all over again? Right? I think that's, that's, that's uh, and has it been helpful? I reckon this is what you want to ask. So my answer to that would be that um, I typically am involved with multiple companies that, where things change very quickly, very soon, right? That's the nature of fast moving startups that exist. Philosophy was in a way, uh, my way of grounding myself in ideas and things that don't change very much or to principally have a foundation for uh, something to balance out this hyper speed at which my life operates. And has it been helpful? I have really enjoyed not knowing anything because you know, in many rooms that I've been in in the past few years, I seem to be the person that a lot of people come to for answers, right? And not having that expertise or not having what you call a deep competitive edge uh, when it comes to studying philosophy has been has been great for me. Plus, you know, I have no aspirations of, you know, trying to think like quote unquote philosophers, because when I even see them at the best of institutions, I also realize how little they know about many things, right? including how the world runs. Um, sometimes they're teaching data ethics when they don't really know like how that how that works out. So my conclusion is that everyone is blind. I am blind. The person teaching me is blind. The set of people who write big books are blind. And we are all united in being blind. And that's absolutely okay. Being blind to most things gives us the energy and clarity to direct our, uh, um, you know, our clarity towards some things. So that's been particularly helpful. And um, it, it, one advantage that I also received was that because I read so much that reading most things are quite easy for me. I'm typically able to absorb uh, whatever. Reading a lot of the philosophy texts, right? Especially the ones on applied philosophy are, are for me very difficult. So when you learn to do difficult things, you also tend to have your mind work at a higher level, which rubs off on other aspects. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, I had a question that I also put in chat. And um, as someone who has interviewed uh, many people from and attended an array of like top tier pedigree institutions, um, Ashoka and CR Oxford included, uh, did your perspective change around the hype of such institutions in hindsight and how? Yeah, this is also a question between above average and very good uh, because it synthesizes a lot. It establishes the context of what uh, Raghav truly wishes to ask me. And uh, I'll answer that and help that become a great question. So um, I actually know or knew that uh, a lot of the branding done for institutions is, it, is their competitive advantage. So for me, I went in with that knowledge that this is a uh, part of it is uh, very much uh, the way the institutions frame themselves. But the question is that Peter Thiel, a lot more famous person than I, also criticizes Stanford a lot. That, you know, like the education system is like a, 
like a factory, doesn't need to teach you how to think, etc. But I would still go to Stanford, he says, because if you don't go and then you criticize people say, oh, sour grape, grapes are sour. So I also uh, come from the same point of view that I, I'm not necessarily a big critic of, of the uh, of the higher education institution. I'm a big critic of the way education is construed into a race, that you need to become the number one at ABCD. So um, for that, the being part of good institutions gives you the credibility that people won't say grapes are sour. But I'm trying to essentially build that network capital into that institution, which is a lot inex more inexpensive and hopefully a lot more egalitarian than any other institution. So that when people are a part of network capital, they can just say that, oh, I am critiquing it, having been part of the world's best run community or the world's best talent platform. We are not there yet, but we are not that far off as well. People have started writing network capital in their uh, statements of purpose, putting it on their resumes, and we've recommended a whole bunch of people for exceptional talent visas in England and America, and every single one of them has gotten it. So no, my opinion hasn't changed because I knew that some of it was deliberate branding done. And having gone through an experience, you can look at its flaws much more uh, clearly if, if it all there are. But uh, if you were to say that, will I reverse my decision? I would probably not. I would still go through through those choices. What I would do is that I'll probably uh, uh, get more experience uh, before an MBA. That is something, that is the one decision of getting more experience that I would change in hindsight. And now what will make this question into an excellent question is mostly language, right? The excellent question would be, uh, having attended uh, uh, pedigreed institutions, do you feel the benefit of attending them exceeds the hype associated with it? Right? This is essentially what Raghav is asking, but this is uh, uh, just rooted in benefit versus perceived benefit. Right. So this is the second order thinking that all of you should do when you come to asking questions of about anything. Um, and I, once you develop that into a, a, a habit, it'll, it'll change you. I also recommend that uh, if there are no more questions or if there are questions, please raise your hands and ask them. I'll wait for a second before I move on. Okay, so the way you also develop your uh, questioning ability is to answer in unobvious ways. When a, a a person who's serving you at a restaurant comes and asks you, how is the food? Don't say great. If somebody asks you, how are you doing? Don't say I'm doing good. Because that, uh, that way you all sort of uh, memorize the right answer and almost on autopilot speak it out when asked. Instead, when somebody asks you an obvious question, answer it in a way that actually exists. How is your day? answer it the way it was. My day was actually quite perfect or my day was, you know, horrible. And I learned this and that. So uh, when the waiter comes and asks you, how was the food? You said, I really like the soup. The, the, the tomato was a bit hard though. So you're in a way forcing your mind to answer obvious questions in an unobvious way. This will enable the other person also to change tracks. You'll notice that when people have conversations up front, the first set of how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. How's the weather? It's okay. How's your weather? Great. Taxes are bad. Life is bad. And this like this chit chat, which goes on for a while. People have this kind of chit chat just to establish comfort. Once you know that you've done chit chat for like five, 10 minutes, you can actually let serendipity shape the conversation. I actually don't, I'm not a fan of that. I do it. Uh, certain times when I have to do, but I try and get to the essence without making it too heavy for the uh, for the listener. For example, if you meet somebody at a party or uh, at a group and suddenly you know jump into existential questions or start throwing uh, data about education system, people will think that wow, what a freak. But there is a way to find a common ground, and there is a way to answer questions that provokes the other person to ask the same question, okay? 
So um, you have it in you, the power to shape the conversation that will make you wiser and the other party wiser as well. I implore you to structure conversations that way. The office hours that we have is a private time. You're all uh, subscribers of Network Cable. You and I have a professional relationship which is rooted in a lot of warmth and uh, love and care for each other. However, the entire world is not that. So uh, structure your conversations and questions in a way that you keep the other person's time and interest and efficiency in mind and also your own because the worst thing to do is to spend 10 hours and not learn anything new about yourself or the other person. That is called time waste. And you should all waste time, but there are many creative ways of wasting time. Having an uninteresting, unintelligible conversation just for the heck of it, that's pretty random. I don't think you should spend your time doing anything of that sort. Okay? So let me summarize. What have I told you? Because we've covered a wide range of things. The first is the child method of asking questions is awesome, but not time sensitive. When you ask questions, implore your second order thinking to come into effect. And your goal in life is to make asking great questions part of your default. I've gone uh, from spending many days prepping for uh, advanced high pressure conversation into spending a few hours and the results seem to be in the right direction. And I've not done anything too special apart from being consistent with what I really want to get out of that conversation. Um, for all your questions, I'm very happy that all of you shared. Now, this week, I want you all to judge yourselves at the end of this week, next Monday, on the quality of questions that you asked. Do remember that context will not change the quality, which means that if you ask your mom horrible questions, you will not suddenly ask the CEO of your company great questions and vice versa. So you have to get into the habit of asking thoughtful questions to everybody. And your goal should not become to become a LinkedIn influencer or write a big post on, uh, on how to ask questions. Feel free to do that if you want. But essentially, I want you all to enjoy and understand life much more. Towards that end, questions are your biggest uh, toolkit. So dive deep and we can uh, make all of this happen together. If you have any follow up questions, please do let me know and I will um, also encourage you to sign up for office hours. The link uh, has changed uh, for anyone who wants can use that. OK, thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye.